Boy, howdy, do I have a project for you guys. <laughs> We've been away for a while, but we're back now. It's time to do some mocktails on Mike's Hard Reviews. Roll that intro. Hey there, there, my name is Michael. Welcome back to Mike's Hard Reviews. I'm a bartender and mixologist from Kalamazoo, Michigan. And today we're going to be celebrating dry January with five mocktails for you to enjoy while you are choosing not to imbibe. Since the start of the month, I have been researching uh, mocktails that we can present here on the show for all you guys as sort of a way to say welcome to the idea of dry January. So if you're not familiar with the concept of dry January, a quick idea of it is that everybody who is in this industry, whether it's a content creator like myself or somebody who's actually involved in bar service directly, uh, we take a break from drinking. Um, whether that's uh, for a week, for two weeks, for the whole month, the folks over at Whiskey Tribe do it, I think, every quarter or every three, uh, every three months or every two months, something like that. Um, or maybe I think it's like a week every month, actually. The idea is that you take a break from drinking in order to assess how you're handling drinking. And I'd like to say that mine has gone very well thus far, which I'm very happy about. However, I have found myself becoming very, very bored. Uh, and not being able to produce episodes of this show like I normally would featuring cocktails, I had to reach for the next best thing, mocktails. A mocktail is a non-alcoholic preparation of juices and other ingredients that follows the same rules as a cocktail and in general should be equally as good just without the alcohol. So today I pulled up five of those mock five mocktails that I think are gonna be awesome that you guys are really going to enjoy, uh, three of which are borrowed and two of which are of my own creation. So the ones that we're borrowing are gonna come from this book right here, which is Mocktails by Richard Mann. Now, uh, this is a cocktail textbook that I picked up a little while ago. And uh, before we jump into it itself, I do wanna talk about the author just a little bit because I think he's actually like really, really cool. Uh, so Richard uh, is the child of Chinese immigrants uh, from Hong Kong to Sweden. And that's actually where he gets his start in bartending and restaurant touring. He works as a bartender in his parents' restaurant and then eventually goes on to continue that profession in other places like Lisbon and London, I think New York and a bunch of other places. Outside of just bartending, he's owned his own tavern. He has been a Bacardi brand ambassador. He has done just a bunch of stuff. And one of those things is write this book. Now Richard says himself that uh, when he and his wife were having their first child, um, the experience of having to move away from drinking alcohol because your wife's pregnant and you're gonna be considerate of that. They found that requesting mocktails or non-alcoholic drinks had a really, really negative impact on the quality of their meals and the places that they went, the experiences they were having. You see, Richard is very much focused not just on alcohol, but on the, the importance of its presence in experiences. Because in Sweden, alcohol is very, very common. There's a lot of drinking happening. And when you sort of take the alcohol away from that and you're just drinking mixed drinks and punches and things that are non-alcoholic, you can have the same fun experience, but it's usually not tailored the same way that cocktails and wine pairings and beer pairings are. So what he's done in mocktails is combine 50 ingredients, sorry, excuse me, 50 recipes with a bunch of unique ingredients that you might not find in a lot of places or find a lot of use for um, in other contexts and then pair them with specific meals and, and give them different varietal. It's really, this is a, a culinary work of art, I think. And he's done a phenomenal job. Uh, with this. The way that mocktails is uh, divided is into five sections, a section for uh, every base of the mocktail you're making. So that's water, uh, juices, tea, uh, kombucha, and beer, wine, and cider, specifically non-alcoholic beer, wine, and cider. We're not going to look at those last two uh, because kombucha is still technically uh, alcoholic. It is a fermented uh, beverage. It does produce a very small amount of alcohol um, when you do that. And I'm doing a zero proof dry January, so I'm gonna avoid that. Uh, and then I'm also going to avoid the section on um, beer, wine, and cider, non-alcoholic beer, wine, and cider. Because um, even in even in uh, Richard's own words, a lot of the character of wine in particular is lost when you take away the alcohol. Uh, and I just don't personally find that to be a very um, interesting thing to do. I just not, I just don't want to do it. <laughs> 
But we're gonna look at uh, one mocktail from each of those first three sections, the water, juices, and tea sections. And then we're also gonna look at a couple of mocktails that I've created myself, uh, both featuring two different kinds of ethoses to, to give you guys something to try while you are also not drinking along with me. So let's go ahead and uh, get started on our first mocktail. All right, so the first section in Mocktails by Richard Mann is about water. So drinks that use water as their base for all of the other flavors. And we're gonna do a one that I thought was really fun that I hadn't thought of before, a peppery watermelon aqua fresca. So let's make some watermelon aqua fresca. Somebody give me grief in my comments a while ago for using a cobbler shaker. So we're gonna use a Boston today just to placate them. <laughs> to begin, I'm gonna start with half of an ounce of simple syrup. We'll come behind that with half an ounce of freshly squeezed lime juice. Behind that, we're gonna do one and three quarter ounces of uh, water. I'm gonna crack some fresh black pepper in here. And we'll come behind that with our watermelon component. So for this, we're gonna need uh, 340 grams or six ounces of uh, watermelon. It's about four one inch cubes around that amount. So I'm just gonna kind of play it by eye here and assume that that's enough. Before we go any further, we're gonna go ahead and give this a muddle to break up that watermelon. And finally, we need our basil component, which I'm doing last because I didn't wanna over muddle it and put too much flavor in here. We're gonna go ahead and add five freshly picked, freshly washed basil leaves. That's all of our ingredients, so let's set that aside and grab our ice container. As is always the case, I'm gonna stick with my ethos of one large cube whole and one large cube cracked. I'm gonna pour our Boston together, I'm gonna tap to seal it, and shake for about 10 seconds. Put that down, crack that on open. Get your serving glass ready, so I've got a chilled pint glass here that we're gonna fill with some ice. Hit that. Get the ice, grab our Hawthorn strainer, cap that up, and just do a pour on that over our fresh ice. Huh. Admittedly, this was not a problem that I foresaw. <laughs> Full disclosure, this is the first time that I've made these, these mocktails, and the recipe in the book stated that it was for a serving for two people. This is considerably less than I thought I was going to get. <laughs> no matter, it's an aqua fresco, so no issue with topping it up with some fresh club soda. For a garnish, I'm gonna go ahead and grab a wedge of lime here, perch that on the rim. And there you have, ladies and gentlemen, a watermelon aqua fresca. So we got everything cleaned up. Let's go ahead and give our uh, watermelon aqua fresco a sip. Cheers. Oh man, <laughs> that is super nice. So clearly it's not a very potent aqua fresco. This is very much lengthened with that club soda because I didn't foresee the measurements being so small for what it was. It's phenomenal. Um, I it's It's fresh and light and the carbonation is there. There's a natural kind of fructosey sweetness to it, even though we did add a little bit of simple syrup on the back end. It could use a little more lime, and it could use a little more watermelon. I feel like you could probably double the amount of watermelon uh, and then maybe go to like two and a half ounces of water. Like it, the spec is what I would want to play with because I feel like this is built to be good, but like it's just having to lengthen it so much <laughs> was not an anticipation I had. Um, and I think it hurts it ever so slightly. That said though, that is fresh and fruity and tasty, and it has like whole watermelon in it, which is awesome, especially when watermelon's in season because it's not right now. Maybe that's why the volume was so off. Watermelon's a lot juicier when it's in season and it's January right now. So that's probably where that comes from. But that is our first mocktail done. Very, very tasty. Let's go ahead and reset and then we'll do our next one featuring juices. So the next section in the book is on juices. And this one in particular is kind of fascinating because it shows how you can think of more uncommon juice flavors and fruits to, from which to pull juice than the normal like orange, lemon, lime, grapefruit, stuff like that. This cocktail or mocktail rather is called the Backyard Highball and it does the juice thing in a really fascinating manner. This recipe calls for two things, a specialized syrup, uh, which is like a lavender, 
rosemary lime syrup. I have it here. I think this is super interesting, but um, it's it's definitely um, it's not a struggle to make, but like it takes a second to get down. So um, the recipe for this is in the description down below. I did modify it slightly for the sake of making it a little bit more comprehensible, but nothing too different from what it was. The The real thing that gets me is that um, this requires the use of grilled lemon juice. I live in an apartment, I don't own a grill, but I did my best to caramelize a lemon with uh, brown sugar and uh, salt, and it didn't really work, so I think you could just skip that, but I feel like mentioning that what this is essentially trying to do is give you a, a collection of flavors that I don't know, man, or like backyard barbecue-y, I suppose. <laughs> so let's go ahead and make a backyard highball. We're gonna start this off with three quarters of an ounce of our specialized lavender syrup. We're gonna come behind that with one full ounce of freshly squeezed orange juice. And then finally, I'm gonna try and juice this grilled lemon. Um, I don't. I don't think this is fully necessary. You can just do, you can just do a regular lemon. Uh, one ounce of freshly squeezed lemon juice. That's all of our ingredients, so let's go ahead and add some ice. One cube whole and one cube crack, as always. We'll go ahead and cap that up, tap it down, and give that a shake for just 10 seconds to combine because you don't want any of this to freeze. We're gonna grab a highball glass out of our freezer, and I'm gonna crack open some club soda. We're gonna start off our effervescence, just pour some of that in there. And then we will double strain our cocktail over that. From there, we'll go ahead and fill this up with some smaller ice. And then top that up with our remaining soda. As a garnish, we're gonna grab a piece of lime and perch that on the rim. And then on top of that, we're going to add just a nice big sprig of rosemary to complement that specialized syrup, which is not fitting. <laughs> but that, ladies and gentlemen, is our backyard highball. I'll give that a taste. Cheers. Oh, that is delightful. Oh. Oh, that is so good. <laughs> that specialty syrup contains uh, like lime zest and rosemary and lavender tea and it is so rich and three-dimensional and full-bodied and it tastes like all of those things very very prominently and the backing of the lemon and the orange juice behind that gives us this extra dimension off of which we can play and it tastes so good it's really impressive because you wouldn't think that without like the botanicals of gin or something, these things might fall flat. No, that syrup is making up for that loss of complexity. And it's so, so nice. Honestly, that is refreshing. And if it was, if the lemon was properly charred, actually, I see how that would be kind of like backyard, barbecue, garden party vibes. Like that would be perfect. Oh my goodness. That is awesome. That is, that might be my favorite one, I think. That might end up being my favorite one. <laughs> well, that is the Backyard Highball, the second of five mocktails. So let's go ahead and reset and move on to the section of Richard's book on tea. So the third mocktail we'll be doing is from the section of the book on tea. And a lot of those preparations include both hot and cold varietals. Um, there's a whole section of each of these parts of the book that includes, you know, special technique and methods for making special ingredients. And one of those is a jasmine tea cold brew, which appears in this recipe. This is a jasmine tea cold brew uh, with mace added, actually. And if you don't know, mace is the shells of nutmeg. So it's like a nutmeg, but spicier. And uh, I have had a slip of this. It is very, very cool. And honestly, I was a little worried about this one because tea is so uncommon in a lot of um, mocktails. At least here in America, you don't think about tea as a common ingredient. So knowing that this one came out so well and so cool, I'm very excited to give this a try. This mocktail is called Le Fleur de Vie, or the Flower of Life, and we're gonna make one right now. To start off, I'm gonna do half an ounce of simple syrup. We're gonna come behind that with one and a half ounces of freshly squeezed orange juice. And finally, a relatively simple mocktail, we're gonna do uh, three ounces of this mace-infused jasmine tea cold brew. 
So that's all of our ingredients, but there's actually no ice in the shaking for this recipe. So um, what instead we're gonna do is cap this up, tap that down, and dry shake it to froth the orange juice and tea together 10 to 15 seconds like you would any regular cocktail. Now for this particular cocktail, I have a very special, very small ice and a chilled sort of, um, I guess, a cocktail flute. I don't really know what else to call it. So <laughs> we're gonna fill this up with our smaller ice and then we're gonna double strain our mocktail over that. To garnish this, we're gonna grab an orange here and cut that pole to pole. I'm gonna take just a nice half of that orange and perch that on the rim like so. And then over top of that, we're gonna sprinkle some ground nutmeg. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the fleur de vie, or the flower of life in French. Let's go ahead and give this remarkably pretty drink a taste. It's supposed to have a foamier head. I feel like maybe if I had shaken this with a coil, it would have done just a little bit better, or frothed it with a, like, espresso froth, like a milk frother, it might be better, but Either way, it still looks phenomenal, I think. Let's give her a taste. Cheers. Oh, that is so gentle and so nice. <laughs> so the, the tea and the orange synthesize very naturally into what I would describe as a kind of floral combination. And the mace as a result, uh, which is part of the cold infusion for the tea, um, is not as noticeable, but it's present. And it's enough to give it this very kind of unique flavor profile that I don't really think I know how to fully describe. It's not neutral, but it's pretty close. And it's, it's just, hold on. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's sort of just a really nice, sweet, fruity tea. Um, kind of like how um, if you were to ever go to like, um, like an outdoor, event in a park and somebody's got a stand up where they've got these big jugs of tea and aqua frescoes with a fruit floating in them and they're serving them up or like they're free, they're free, you know, free access. That is what this tastes like. It's just this very nice, very like holistic single note that it doesn't have a ton of evolution. It's really just like, mm, yep, orange, a little bit of sweetness, jasmine tea, hint of mace, you know, a little bit of spice, but it's good. And it's really, really refreshing. I, I like this one a lot, not as much as the much more dynamic backyard uh, backyard highball, but this is still really, really good. <laughs> Fee, phenomenal, wow. Oh, I could, oh man, that's a great like breakfast drink right there. That's really, really tasty. Wow, okay, <laughs> nice. <laughs> And so with that, we've talked about all three sections of Richard's book, Mocktails, that we were going to cover in today's episode. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get this cleaned up a little bit, and then I am going to uh, switch on over to, uh, to my first cocktail submission to the video. So in truth, this whole process of learning about mocktails, especially from Richard's perspective as somebody who has worked in restaurants and worked in a lot of bars and done a lot of time investing in how to assemble ingredients, uh, I've discovered that there's really two ways to look at mocktails. They can be their own unique assembly of ingredients, or they can emulate something that already exists. Most of what Richard does in his book is distinctly unique and very much focused on being separate from the world of cocktails uh, and giving mocktails their own legs to stand on. I don't disagree with that, and I think that there are a lot of really great ways to do that. But I also think that a lot of people at home have a very strong connection between um, mocktails and the idea of like non-alcoholic cocktails. The exact same idea done in a non-alcoholic way, just sans alcohol. So today I'm going to show you next up a uh, mocktail that I call a pina cane. It is a combination of a pina colada and a hurricane. A hurricane is a sort of uh, rum-based fruit juice, mostly uh, passion fruit flavored cocktail that is named, that we're from where rather, uh, the actual glass, hurricane, hurricane glass gets its name. And then a pina colada we've talked about frequently on this show. Um, they're just delicious combinations of rum, pineapple, and cream of coconut. Problem with turning any one of those, either one of those, into a mocktail on their own by taking the rum out is that you're left with just a lot of fruit juices and a lot of sweetness and no character to back them up. But when you combine the flavors of both cocktails into one holistic unit, 
you get something I think that is really, really fascinating. So let's go ahead and make a pina cane. Before we do anything with our ingredients, let's get to grab our glass here. This is a hurricane glass. To that, I'm going to start by adding a quarter, excuse me, half of an ounce of grenadine. And then we'll set that aside. With our glass prepped, we're gonna go ahead and do one ounce of cream of coconut. Gonna come behind that with half of an ounce of a passion fruit syrup. You could substitute that for a passion fruit puree if you have one on hand. Um, there are companies that make frozen passion fruit that you basically just melt down and it makes passion fruit juice. Uh, that would be just as good here as well. Next up, we're gonna do the juice of one lime, which I'm gonna shoot directly into this, uh, this shaker here. It's gonna be about half to three quarters of an ounce. And finally, a full four ounces of pineapple juice. We'll add some ice to this to give it a shake. I intend to dirty dump this into our glass uh, to help stir up that grenadine to give us a color gradation. Uh, so we're gonna use smaller ice here and just really load this shaker up. We are gonna cap that up, tap that down, and shake for 10 to 15 seconds to chill and combine and froth up our ingredients. Gonna grab our glass and put that back up front here. Pop off the lid of our shaker and just dirty dump that right on in. Cap that off with just a little bit of extra ice. And now we can talk garnishes. Uh, to garnish this, I'm gonna grab a wedge of lime here and perch that on the rim like so. Hopefully this one stays. And because who doesn't love a good maraschino cherry, we're gonna do a couple of luxardos as well. And then just pin those up there alongside that lime like so. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what I call a pina cane. Alrighty, with our station ever so slightly cleaned up, let's go ahead and give our pina cane a taste. I will say the, the homemade grenadine is hurting the color more than helping it. Um, you can get a really nice red color at the bottom here if you've got, you know, very cheap grenadine, frankly. Um, but I think that still looks pretty damn nice. <laughs> Cheers. Oh, that is so good. Mm. I know that I was using a store-bought passion fruit syrup there. That was the Tarani brand uh, passion fruit syrup. And it actually does have a kind of very natural tartness to it, kind of like how grenadine does when you make it yourself. And I thought that that was a really useful tool. So um, accounting for some additional acid adjustment with that lime that we added, what you get here is this really, really fun, fruity, citrusy, tart and sweet and, and very like fluctuating combination of flavors that even though it is mostly juices, is still giving the impression of a complete cocktail. Uh, one that is, frankly, really, really delicious. <laughs> the coconut cream is providing most of the sweetness and a lot of the body. The passion fruit doesn't give you too much sweetness, actually. It actually has a very sharp kind of tartness to it. And that, in combination with the lime, is giving you this really fun, tropical fruit flavor that the pineapple is reinforcing. And what that equates to is just an absolutely delicious variation on, but I think is a great idea in combina combining two, um, two already like pre-existing cocktails into a single mocktail to make the mocktail work. I think that this is just so much fun. I've had a couple of these actually since having developed this recipe. It's, it's, it's gen genuinely, this is really, really good. <laughs> and if you were to turn this into a actual cocktail, I'd say just take out two ounces of the pineapple juice and do a blend of rums. And you will have the best time, I swear to God. I can't wait till February so I can try this format, but with some rum in it. Cause oh my God, I'm going to be so happy when I can do that. <laughs> so that's four mocktails so far. Let's go ahead and do a quick reset and come back with a fifth mocktail and a final mocktail that expresses the ability to experiment with fun and unique flavors. So our final mocktail today is another one of my own creation and the sort of ethos behind this one was uh, open creativity. One of the problems that I'm having more than anything else is that my hands are idle. 
Um, the way that I engage with alcohol, it's not to get drunk. It's to experiment and research and discover new cocktails and flavors and, and try things and experiment with things and come up with ideas. So when I can't do that, I find myself needing to do it with something else. I've been cooking in this kitchen behind me way more frequently, and I've been experimenting with really weird flavors, and that's exactly what I did here. This is a specific kind of cold brew I've developed called Bombastica Cold Brew for a cocktail that I call a Bombastica, which we're gonna make right now. I'm going to start off with uh, three quarters of an ounce of simple syrup, orgeau, any, any, any sweetener will work, honestly. Um, just whatever you have on hand is fine. <laughs> Full disclosure, I've been using a bottle of Monon Orgeau this whole time because my simple syrup, uh, something fell into it and it went bad. Um, and uh, this is indistinguishable as a Orgeau. But more importantly, the thing about this cocktail is that it's a very robust cocktail. The Bombastic is very loud. So uh, whether you're using Orgeau or a macadamia nut syrup or a hazelnut or a black sugar syrup, which might show up a little bit, or regular simple syrup, you're really just trying to combat the bitterness of the coffee, which we're gonna add next. For our cold brew, we're gonna do four full ounces of the Bombastica Special. Now, what makes Bombastica different from a regular cold brew? This is a combination of uh, specifically Café du Monde, which is a New Orleans style coffee that contains chicory root, uh, black tea, and mint. So these things have been allowed to cold infuse for 24 hours and collectively they create a really unique flavor profile that combines the tannins of tea, the bitterness and a sort of acrid earthiness of coffee and the bright sort of lightning flavors of mint, uh, which honestly you could all do separately. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second here, but phenomenal, very interesting ingredient. We'll add some ice to this and I'm gonna dirty dump it. So I'm just gonna do some smaller ice. And we will cap that up, tap it down, and give it a shake to chill and combine for just about 10 seconds. The design of the Bombastica was to be something that combines a lot of flavors very boldly and very loudly, and then is kind of showmanshipy about it. So I like to serve it in a chilled uh, snifter. <laughs> Crack this bad boy open, kind of carefully, because coffee does like to foam when you shake it. And then we'll just pour that. Right on in. Now that is an awesome foamy head and it will kind of settle up towards the top as time goes on. Uh, if you were to garnish this, uh, I don't necessarily think it needs it, but I would say you should use mint. Um, mint is not in season, so I'm gonna have to make a stand in. I'm gonna do that with a sprig of rosemary. <laughs> Just something green, something green to offset the brown. <laughs> Very neutral tones in this house. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a Bombastica. Let's go ahead and give that a taste. Cheers. Oh. God, that is so delightfully odd. <laughs> it's very bold and rich, kind of acidic, and um, sort of earthy, acrid bitterness from the coffee, which is the majority of its flavor profile. But you're also getting uh, really interesting herbal notes from the black tea, and I'm using an orange peco tea here specifically, like Lipton, um, just because it was on hand and cheap and readily available. But you'd find that with something like an Earl Grey as well. The mint is a little subdued, actually. I think maybe this batch didn't have quite the right amount of it in there, um, but it is sort of giving it this nice brightness. It's just a little bit of extra something, something uh, that gives the cocktail just like this, this really interesting desserty vibe without being very, very sweet. Yeah, it's almost kind of like brandy in a way. Actually, and I'm realizing now, maybe that's why I like it in a snifter, because it has a kind of raisiny characteristic to it between the sort of rooty beaniness of the coffee and the tannic and kind of fruity nature of the tea, which I guess is like super, super awesome. Cool. <laughs> but that is the Bombastica. That has been one of my favorites of this whole thing. Getting to experiment with coffee, something that I really, really enjoy and do a fair amount of experimentation with in my personal time, uh, to turn it into something like this that is just straight up a unique concept you're not gonna find anywhere else. <laughs> All righty, ladies and gentlemen, that is five mocktails for dry January. Three from Richard Mann and two from myself, including a peppery watermelon basil aqua fresca, the backyard highball, the Flor de vie, a pina cane, and the Bombastica coffee cocktail. 
this was an insane amount of work. <laughs> uh, but it was a lot of fun. And I think what hopefully you're taking away from this is that there's a lot of options out there for people who aren't going to be drinking. Whether it's you're the designated driver for the night, or you just don't drink for religious or dietary reasons, or you just don't drink because you don't want to drink. This is all of the awesome possibilities that you can successfully pull off with non-alcoholic ingredients. And hopefully this gives you guys some inspiration to, if you haven't done it this year, try dry January next year or take a dry week for yourself sometime this year, or even just experiment with the idea of mocktails as a concept because there's a lot that can be done with such an incredible platform. That being said, I am so tired. There are so many dishes to do. And I'm just really hoping that the new camera is making all of that look Really, really nice. <laughs> That's all we have today, so let's go ahead and do a rating from our book, Crisp Toasts. It's been two plus weeks. I don't remember where we were at. I'm, I'm gonna just pick one from the section on adversity. <laughs> our toast today goes as such. To the difficulties that we have encountered in acknowledgement of the fact that they have made us stronger. Cheers. This one, Little de Vie. That's the, that's the cool one. That's the fun one. I like that one. Thank you guys all so much for watching and thank you again for waiting for two weeks for me to produce any more content for the channel. I really do appreciate all of you who have shown and been so excited to see more content, especially mocktails content. Um, hopefully this is what you guys were hoping for. Um, if you enjoyed it, do click that like button and subscribe down below and you can follow me on my socials that are appearing on the screen now or have been up for some time. Uh, I'm usually just on TikTok or here, so I mean, do whatever you want. <laughs> but I am uh, gonna go try and uh, finish all of these uh, and then fall into a diabetic coma probably. So <laughs> thank you guys so much for watching. You guys have a good rest of your day. Please remember to drink responsibly and hopefully your dry January goes as swimmingly as my hand, mine has. <laughs> Stay around. Bye-bye.